So, let's start. Once upon a time, there was a software program called Jake. Jake was working for a mid-sized software company, and uh, he was a Java guy by heart. He was basically the, basically the top one guy at the company. So he knew everything about enterprise Java with rich, flat clients with Swing. And one day, his boss came to him and said that, hey, Jake, um, after our bi-weekly strategy meeting for the company, we decided that our new strategy is web-based products. So Jake was a bit uh, afraid of that, as he has not never done anything with web. But obviously, he started thinking, yeah, 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 OK, some modern and cool web stuff, JavaScript, CSS3, and things like that. So he agreed with his boss that he will write a simple prototype within two weeks for the existing product. Basically, a web page that you can query the database, edit some data, and store it. So first, it was obviously a really good idea, but Jake started working. He basically worked through, through night and day, fighting with JavaScript, and he decided to do some cool animations to all the buttons that everyone would click there, show progress indicators, how the query goes. And Jake was basically looking like this after a while. But eventually he got it done, and they held a demo. And the boss was so excited about the whole thing that he also called in some customers to see the new prototype. This is going to be cool. So Jake didn't realize that he was actually working with a Google Chrome browser, his favorite one and used all the CSS3 and all the JavaScript gimmicks there. And then the customer started the whole application with an old Internet Explorer. So none of the buttons actually worked. Nothing happened. JavaScript errors everywhere. So Jake was <laughs> pretty much like this. So welcome to the Vardin presentation. So my name is Bill Engman. I'm from the Vardin team, located in Frankfurt. And this really little story is a small example of the problems that actually we try to solve for you guys at the Vardin team. So how many of you actually know what Vardin is already? All right, few hands raising. So how many of you are actually building something with Vardin? your hands again. All right. OK. So let's start. So we are going to, this is basically the whole thing. So I'm going to introduce you within the next 45 minutes what Vardin is, what things is in it, and I'm trying to play around with the REST API of the OpenNMS demo server. So let's see how that goes. So today, Vardin, we have the version number 7 out. And start learning about Vardin is obviously what Vardin means. It's, it's coming from Finland, and it's a Finnish word. So it's a reindeer. So now when you look, look at my cool t-shirt, all the geeks can, are starting to see the logic there. Ah, yeah, yeah, the horns and the nose, yeah. So, but most of all what Vardin is, it's a web application framework. Java framework for building rich web applications. So, and what the logo here also presents is what we do. With Java, we hide the HTML, the JavaScript, the web side, the evil side, the dark side of, of enterprise Java. But it has actually a pretty long history. The first version got out way back way back. So 2002, we released the first open source version of Vardin. And after that, Ajax, this huge, cool thing, that Ajax came along, so we took it in, of course. And at that time, we were playing, playing around with basically handwritten JavaScript, and uh, Google sent us the godsend Google Web Toolkit so we could skip all the JavaScript writing by hand and stick to Java. We are Java guys. And 2009, 
the version number 6 came out as Vardin as you see it today and the version number 7 is the latest one that we have just released. So, about Vardin more. So basically the Vardin 7 now that we have, it's the coolest thing ever for us, obviously. So, what it has, it has pretty cool web stuff there already. We'll go into details uh, later on so you can see it for yourself. But basically, Vardin is a full stack from serverless level all the way to the browser. So the server-side API is ours, the client-side is ours, basically the Google Web Toolkit. It's all in Vardin nowadays. So the obvious question, and this is a really important one, when you should actually use Vardin for anything? Well, this is when you have to use Vardin. These awesome UIs that everybody has, you know, these heavy lifting backbone applications that everybody runs their business with. This is the area where Vardin fits best. So basically, if you're planning to do your homepage or something, you know, don't use Vardin for that. It's not a web application. So basically, this is something that might come out when you actually start working with Vardin for these backbone applications. So this is what people do with body. So let's see if I actually can show you a little dashboard example. Uh, yeah, there we have it. <coughs> dashboard. So this is one small demo application that we've done with Varden ourselves, so you get an idea what kind of stuff you can do. So this is basically a web application for um, taking care of uh, movie theater shows and get reports from that. So here we have a nice dashboard showing some cell figures for <coughs> top movies, popular movies, uh, we can go to schedule here, see you know what kind of stuff is running, organize that bit if I would have the privileges, and stuff like that. This is all Vardin that, that you see. It's a single base application using the Vardin components and built with Java. Small example. Let's continue. So the key ideas of Vardin, three ideas here. First of all, rich components, obviously. If you want to build something like that, you've got to have rich components. So the components are three different types. Of course, the user interface, components, buttons, tables, what you can see, but also components for accessing your data and themes. Themes are what we call uh, the packages of CSS and things that take care of all the visual appearance of your application. So, user interface components first. If you go to Vardin.com, you can find a sampler application. Basically, an application that lists all the components that Vardin has. Obviously, there is any, everything that you can expect from a modern web application framework. Tables, lazy loading stuff, combo boxes, filtering stuff, drag and drop. You name it. There's also some cool new uh, demo applications that we just put out. You can browse through what Vardin has, play around with it online. And if these basic set components are not enough for you, we have introduced this cool mechanism for Vardin ecosystem so that everyone can publish their own components. It's basically a web shop. Okay, most of them are actually open source, but you can share your work, share your components. You can find things here that are really useful for many projects, but it doesn't make sense to have them in the core Vardin. So this is actually a really, really nice um, asset to have when you are building something. One example, paper stack component. It's really cool, but doesn't make any sense to have it in Vardin itself, but it's still there. So what this component does, I'm actually browsing through 
to the actual sample. Here's the component. Someone did this for some projects and published the results. I think it's pretty cool. But as you can see, you know, having that in core Vardin, well, I, I don't know about that. But you can still find it here. All right, themes. Vardin has a built-in themes. This is the default. If you just start throwing in some components, this is what you get. Or you can change to another one. With the same Java, for Java, you can switch to another theme and it looks like this. Or you can use the chameleon theme where you are able to select your colors to different elements and then download the theme packets and there you have a Vardin theme with these colors that you just uh, set. So if you really go to theming, you could actually make an applica application like this. This is a Vardin application, but it's themed to iTunes. So that's possible. But don't, don't take me wrong, you know. <laughs> this doesn't help, this doesn't uh, actually solve your problems with <laughs> buying music. It doesn't play anything, so uh, doesn't help. So then comes the da data source. In Vardin, we have this three level abstraction level, so to speak, to all data. So the property at the bottom is basically just a key value pair, name, ville, or an item, basically a plain old Java object, all in all, all these attributes. And a container is basically an array list or a vector or something like that, list of pojos. And there are different con type of containers, obviously. For example, if you want to do a tree, uh, use a tree component, it has to have some hierarchy in it, and so forth. But these are, these are something that all of the Vardin components understand. If you have a text field, you can say, that, OK, the data source property is this one. Or if you have a table, you can always say that the container data source is this one. And for containers, for example, you can have like Eclipse link container put in a table. Or you can have an in-memory or bean container put in a table. It's the same data API that Vardin components understand. All right. Let's talk about the server and the client side. So in our, in our world, we talk about server as the web application server, and the client is the browser. That's how we understand that. So if we look at the web application layers, backend server, HTTPS database, the web server, basically Tomcat, Teddy, something like that. Then the RPC between your servlets, for example, on the way to the clients at the browser, where the JavaScript side um, rely. The lies. So, um, if you're using Google Web Toolkit, for example, and you build your system, these are all the layers that you have to do to get something on the screen. There's no other way. If you use Vardin for that, only these two are required. So basically, like I said, Vardin hides the dark side of things from you. You don't have to go there, but if you want to, you can. Another example here, just plain JavaScript. Pretty much the same than Google Web Toolkit is, but Google Web Toolkit has this Java to JavaScript compilation there. <coughs> architecture. I'm sure you guys love architectural diagrams. So here's a simple example. On the right side, there's the backend server. Again, databases, Enterprise Java Beans, whatever you have. Then you have the web server like Tomcat here, and there is your UI code. This is the world that you live in, and you build your UIs with Vardin here. When it continues, this is the API. You are just using components from the Vardin library. They have their own API methods there. And all of these components, they have a counterpart on the client side. So basically, they have their own image on the browser. 
And obviously, you have the theme there, CSS, images, that's what you have. And you can even do some custom UI with third-party libraries, other JavaScript libraries, uh, whatever you might have there. And you can integrate directly to the Vardin clients as well. And these can have their own backends as well, like REST services, calling REST from client side. So, how does it work, really? Small example, here's a small piece of Vardin code. There's a text field and a button. For the button, we declare in Java that we're going to listen clicks. If someone clicks the button, I'm listening to that. So basically, with this piece of code, you get something this to the screen. First, you go to the address and the initial HTML and the JavaScript that was compiled with Google Web Toolkit. All the resources that are needed are loaded to the browser. When we go through some compress uh, and reduce the client, client side footprint, it's around 120 or 200 Ks that is loaded to the browser. That's all it is. And when it's executed, this is on the screen. There's the text field, there's the button. Then someone comes in, types in name, and push the button. Behind the scenes, there's an Ajax call going through that delivers. This name is Jonas button clicked. <coughs> Few bytes goes to the server. And on the server side, this piece of code is called. So you can hook into that, for example, with a debugger with Eclipse or something. And here you just say that, okay, I show a notification on the screen. Hi. Nay. Again, on the other side, the response comes back, and the client side says, that, hey, I'm, I'm showing a notification here. And it's done. So that's basically the concept how Vardin works. But let's, um, let's try it out. <coughs> OK. Maybe I should turn on the mirroring. Everybody can see it again. Yes. All right. So what I have here is just an Eclipse instance. So there's uh, nothing, nothing to it that much. I guess you are, you are all Eclipse guys, right? No. <laughs> all right. Not only. Not only, yeah. All right, all right. OK. So please you know, debug all my mistakes, all right? So help me out. OK, so let's start. What I have here, I have only installed the Vardin plugin for Eclipse. So basically, when I want to create a new project, there's the Vardin 7 project. So let's do that. And let's give it uh, some name. For example, um, also like this. And I'm choosing an Apache Tomcat for the runtime. For the configuration, I just use servlets. I could use other as well, but I use this servlet. And I'm just deploying it on a Tomcat. I'm not deploying it on, on a Google App Engine or, or a portlet. So just the default. And the volume version, the latest one. All right? Simple, simple. Let's take the context also. So mm, I think that's fine. So this is basically the name of the Java class that is created. So let's just fire, fire this up. All right. So now we have a project, and let's see what's in it. So it's an Ivy, Ivy-based project. Um, if we go to the Java sources and see what we have here, we have one Java class. So this is basically my Vardin application right now. I'm extending an UI. This UI comes from the Vardin package. And the only method that I have to implement to get anything on the screen is the init. 
So this is the default. Let's see how that looks like uh, after a while. And other things is the web XML. Can you all see the text? Absolutely. Yeah, good. So what we have here, we have only one servlet. So this Vardin servlet comes from the Vardin library. You didn't write this. But this is the one that you write. So basically we just say here that, all right, you are the servlet and you, this is the implementation of my application. And nothing dramatic on top of that. So if we fire this up, back on server. Let's see. <coughs> <coughs> All right. Let's take that to a real browser. So. This is the first Vardin application that you get from, from the uh, plugin, create new project. Basically, you click this, just say thank you for clicking. So it's a pretty nice, pretty nice application already. So what happens here is that, so what happens here is that we just declare the main layout for the Vardin application here. We said that, okay, it has a margin, you know, uh, and this application has the root con content is my layout here. Then I create a new button, and I add a click listener to the button there. So basically, this piece of code is called whenever someone clicks, clicks the button. And here we just add, add a new component, the label component to the layout. Thank you for clicking, thank you for clicking. Simple stuff. And at the end, we add the component, this button to the layer, and that's it. Any questions at this point? All clear? Pretty much so. All right. So that's not that interesting at this point. So maybe we could play around with the uh, OpenNMS um, <coughs> REST API. So here, here you can have to understand that, okay, yes, we are integrating to a REST API, but we are integrating to that from, from the server side. Everything that is here executed is executed within the web server. And I think that's an awesome way to attach or, or integrate your web applications to a resource that you don't really know how it's implemented or what the technology is behind that. So this is a great way to do that. So. Um, let's, let's see, I could actually, um, get a, a bit back. The layout is okay, margin, yes. Uh, yeah. So let's take a vertical layout. Layout, here. Set size full. I'm basically one that this layout covers the whole whole web browser. And then I am adding to uh, create a new panel. So I thought that I, I would just do a small query to the alarms alarms um, API from o OpenNMS. So I can call this the recent alarms. And again, I'll say that this panel set size full. Uh, and in this layout, I want small margins around that. And layout, add component, panel. So basically, this is how you build your Vardin UIs. You, 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 you pick one layout type, and you start creating new components and add, add them to each other. And that's basically how you do that. If someone has done anything with Swing, 
it's, it pretty much looks identical. All right. So what do we have on the screen at this point? Nothing? Did I? Oh, yes. So basically, this layout here should be declared as the root. Set content is the layout. So, so here we have a panel, fills the whole screen, stretches when someone changes the size. And now we can start adding things to the panel. So basically at this point, I want to call the REST API of the OpenNMS. So it's basically, I already did that in another project. It's just using a Jersey library for getting the data. So I'll take it in for saving some time. As I'm using Jersey here, I have to add these dependencies, as I'm using Ivy here, not Maven, basically adding the dependencies for the Jersey libraries. These are required to actually call anything. So I go to my projects, Ivy, settings, and put them, oops. Okay, so is someone using Ivy other than me already? No. Someone using Maven. Yeah, Maven or Maven. Ivy? Maven or Ivy? You have to say it in Italian. Ah, Maven. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not that many, so. Yeah. So it's basically, if someone doesn't know what Maven or Ivy does, it basically checks the dependencies for the libraries when you compile the whole system. So that's what it does. You don't have to include all the libraries within the project. You can take them from the Ivy repository. All right, so now I have Jersey there and I have a simple utility. Yes. <laughs> so I take the utility class. Oh, and what I also need, I also have generated beforehand the Java objects for getting the data from the REST API. So basically the OpenNMS has this already. I just use the JuxB, JuxB generator to get the POJOs. So basically when the call is done, these POJOs are populated. So that's, that's just simple stuff, nothing to do with Vardin in a sense. So let's take those in as well. Oops. Okay. So what I just did <coughs> is that I included this my utils for getting the alarms. So this is just basic jersey calling. I here declare the actual handle or the client that calls the REST API from the server side. Here I have the root is I'm calling directly the demo openNMS.org. That's what I'm calling here. And to set the credentials for the authentication, etc., etc. Simple stuff. After that, I say, okay, um, these are the attributes for the query. In this case, I don't have any lim I don't want to have any limits for the amount of things coming from there. <laughs> Always a pretty good idea. And how it's ordered, and that's basically it. And then I'll just call the alarms path in the REST API. So what I get back is the alarms object that is generated for me by the JuxB. And it looks like this. So it basically has all the attributes that the XML response has. And one alarm entity 
this here. Pretty common stuff. All right. So, with this my utils, I'm able to get the alarms. Now, okay. Any questions at this point? No? Good. All right. Oops. So, now I can just take a voting table and put the data in there. So let's take the voting table component here. New table. And I say that this table is also taking all the space. So it's size full. This table set container data source. So this is what we're going to use. My, my container. So let's create this container. I'm using a bean item container. It's just an implementation for a container from the Vardin library. Basically, if you have Java pochos and you want to get them quickly on the screen, the bean item container is your choice. So let's take that one. Oh. Alarm. Container, new, uh, which one is it? This one. And here I put these alarms that I got from the um, REST call. This gives me the list. And here I have to have also the alarm. Restart. Okay. And now when I say to the layout at component table, I should get something on the screen. Let's see. Oh, to the panel. Set content table. You're not debugging for me, are you? All right. Here is basically the raw response from the REST API of OpenNMS already. So as you can see, it's pretty heavy stuff. Quite a lot of data here, but that is basically all the data that I just got from OpenNMS. So the next step is to go through and narrow down the data and pick some stuff that you're actually showing. So let's do that next. So I can say to the table that actually the time is running, so I'll skip, jump ahead a bit. So I'll take this, this is basically what I want. <coughs> now, so I just declare here that what are the visible columns? And these string, strings here, they are just those property names from the actual bean. So that's the default. So that's, you can do this in a, pretty sufficient way, better way, but here you can see how the whole logic comes. So uh, I, just, I just write a list from the existing property of the column names that I want to see, and that's it. So if I refresh, now, now we get something a bit more convenient. I see the data there. Oops. Okay, one little addition. So this is of course nice, but a little chart might, might come in handy. 
So I'll just go and save some time and take the chart that I already have. I'll explain it to you in a moment. So I'm using the Vardin charts add-on to show, show some, some charting here. So it's a pie chart, basically uh, with all the categories that there might be. And uh, let's take that to the project. enough. <coughs> now, so that this step would actually compile, I also need the IV dependency for the Vardin charts. Let's do that. Here we have it. Now we can just fix all the dependencies here, restart, and see what we have. So we have basically <coughs> created the chart object, and in Vardin charts, everything goes through this chart configuration. For with the configuration object and the API, you just say that how the actual chart works. And then you create the series, data series. Here are all the uh, severity levels that OpenNMS provides. So I wrote them here to you guys to see how the whole thing goes. And here I go through the actual data from the request. The list of alarms, count down how many different severities there are, and I create a chart from that. And here I put to layout. Add component chart. Okay, let's see how this looks. Oh yeah, and now actually one thing. Now I just included an add-on to the project, and this add-on has a custom client-side part. Basically, it's on widget set. So now I have to recombine my application's widget set for one time, so that the client side actually knows how to draw this. So if I now go and see what it looks like. It basically says here that, hey, guy, you know, I can't show this. I don't know how to do that. So compile your widget set. <coughs> so simple stuff. There's a button for that. And now it starts to compile. To speed it up a bit, I narrow down the amount of browsers that I'm supporting here. I don't want all the browsers to be compiled. I just want to use the Safari that I'm using. So let's put that here. So here comes this widget set XML file to the project where you can control all this. And if I put here Safari and hit the compile again, now it starts to compile the new Google Web Toolkit JavaScript junk that goes to the client side. It takes a while. So uh, programming with plain Google Web Toolkit on the client side might be a bit heavy because you have to, with every change, you have to compile the whole thing again and again. In this case, as our code is on the server side, we'd have to do it, but only once. So let's give that some time. And let's go to the application and see what's, <coughs> is, if everything is in place here. actually want to have another layout within the panel. So let's see. There's some time before the compilation of the widget set is done. So I just create a new vertical layout. I put that in the panel so that I can put the chart first and then the table 
So that's basically what's happening. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's see if I got it right in the hurry. Yeah. So, here we have it. So, now it counts the minors, the warnings and all. So, basically our, our time is running short for more programming, but the next steps would be to start, you know, putting some more stuff to the table. This is still a bit pretty raw. So format how the actual presentation of this goes. Maybe add a menu there and more stuff. So this is what I was hacking, hacking together um, before this um, presentation. So it's basically pretty much the same, but I continued a bit there. So you could add, click these node labels here. It would show a pop-up uh, what is in the node. And uh, if I click a row here, it actually shows you know, what are the details of this message. And I have this cool menu from the dashboard demo. I just rip it out basically one power of the VAR in itself. It's a component based. So I stripped the menu from another project and just reused it in mine. So this is the way how you should do your own stuff as well. Do components and reuse them in, a, in all the parts that you need. Nothing is implemented here, so uh, it's an ouch. But nothing that, that dramatic. So, let's see, wrong way, Turn off mirroring, <coughs> all right, so any questions from this short hack around stuff, all right, so let's, let's fly, fly through some, some other stuff. So basically with Vardin, it's embracing Java. That's the whole thing. We are Java guys. So what it means, we can do it with any JVM language. Scala, for example, is a good, op good option. There's a nice Scala add-on for Vardin. So you can do Vardin applications with Java. All the major browsers, they are supported with Vardin. So basically when the code that I just wrote there, you don't have to worry whether it's Opera or Internet Explorer or anything that is used. It works the same way. More or less. Yeah, it works. Yeah. Yes. Even more, not less. <laughs> yeah. So basically, there's no plugins or anything in, in there. So it's not relying on any, any applets or anything like that. You just go to a web address, there's a volume up, and it works. Servlets, portlets, clouds supported, obviously, no problem. Tooling, Eclipse, I'm an Eclipse guy. <coughs> Others as well are supported, no problem. And for these guys that will like drag and drop UI building, there's a visual editor as well, so you can drag and drop these components. You can do that. So the Vardin 7 today, the coolest things that we just released <coughs> Here's basically some of that. Google Web Toolkit included. SAS-based themes. Does anyone know what SAS is? Comes from a name, syntactically awesome style sheets, because they are awesome style sheets. So it's, you can program your CSS files. You can have functions, you can have variables, you can do mix-ins, that's really cool. So check that out. And it, it works, it's not barred in only, it's any web stuff. So SAS is a really cool mechanism for you. And in Vardin 7, more extension points 
to do custom JavaScript on the client side, integrate directly to different parts of Vardin. So you can basically drop Vardin application to your existing infrastructure with no problem. So that's pretty cool way to do. Some cool add-ons for Vardin. The Vardin charts you already saw. That's pretty new, pretty cool. It's using the high charts library beneath uh, the surface. So I think that's, I think this is the best web-based charting library there is. So this is really, really nice. All different, all kinds of different types of charts you can do. And all client side and interactive, really cool. <coughs> then we have the Vardin touch kit. So what about mobile? That's the next question. So there's an extension for Vardin, the Vardin touch kit. That all actually, this that you see here is a web application, but it's themed again to iOS look and feel. And if you create a home page bookmark for a web application and hide all the browser bar, uh, this uh, address bars or anything, it actually looks and feels like a native application altogether. So, but you can fire the whole, whole thing up on an Android as well, which is cross-platform mobile stuff. The HTML5 platform is really cool for modern mobile applications. No. That's, that's left for you guys. <laughs> we don't do Android right now. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. Uh, and the Windows 8 platform is actually something we're working on right now as well. So basically all these three major players in the future, you can have them with only one implementation. Things that we've seen people do, for example, Puma here in Germany, one application they're using, uh, the Varin Tatskit for, they have these line managers deciding what they're going to sell next summer, and they sit in the meeting room with their iPads, you know, I like that, I like that, I dropped that, and they create these selling lists with this stuff. And then there's the other, other dudes that come in with Android device, so they can play as well. Oh, this one. This is really cool. NASA is tracking their unmanned aerials in the Bay Area with a Tatsuki app. So uh, that's, that's really cool. And then we have the Vardin test pens as well. Uh, basically, you can automate your UI level regression tests. So you can record your use cases and even take screenshots from your UI in different states. And you can put that to your continuous integration server Hudson or something, and you get the result for a nightly build or anything. So uh, it's really powerful. So getting started, um, I know you are anxious to do that already. Tutorials on the website, obviously. The Eclipse, Eclipse plugin I used, Maven. There's a book of Vardin, free for download. And if you go see, see us on, on any developer conferences in Jax, in mind for next time. We're going to have a huge pile of these Vardin books for a free giveaway gift. So uh, maybe I'll see you there. So once upon a time, there was this software developer called Jake. And his boss came to him with, with an idea. Hey, Jake, we have a new strategy. And Jake was like, bring it on. No problem. All right. Questions, comments, that's my take for today. Four minutes over time. Questions? Ah. Just a minute. The first three, first three questions. <laughs> Get a voting shirt. So let's hear it. There we go. Bamboo, good question. Um, we are running it, it on, on Hudson and TeamCity ourselves. So it's basically JUnit based. You can orchestrate that with Ants or Maven. So it should work, no problem. There you go. There. How is it? It's free to download. Yeah. Where do you make money? Is it, is it, is it packs of add-ons that you charge for? Or? Yeah, a few of these add-ons are dual licensed, but pretty sti cheap still. That doesn't, you know, give us the living. The company is, I think we have around 60 guys, 6-0 six 
in Turku, Finland, here in, uh, in uh, Germany, I'm here, and a couple of guys in the US. So one third of the company are concentrating on the products and the two thirds are consultants. So basically we make a money uh, out of helping others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We help you, we live and we're pretty good at that. There you go. And the last one. Think about Lyft. Think about Lyft? Yeah, Lyft, yeah, in, uh, compared to Bali. Yeah, yeah. Tool, I, I, yeah. Because I've been looking for some smart tools for mm -hmm. this kind of stuff, yeah. So, like two years ago, I started using Lyft. Yeah. But I wasn't really happy or satisfied. Yeah. And that's why I, yeah. That's a so good, tool, so yeah. You know, this is really important question, actually, and to understand, you know, what is behind the whole thing. Vardin is really good for single-page web applications, data-centric, high interactivity between the data and the user, and you do some use cases and you operate something. That's where Vardin is really good. The abstraction level is so high that you can just handle these abstract things like tree or table or something. But what you don't see there that much, you can't go and fiddle with all the small DOM structure details that easily. So if that is what you are after, to really fiddle all these little things yourself, Lyft might be really good for that. Or Wicked is awesome, for example. So it's just another tool for a different purpose. I think that's actually the most important thing for, for a software architect to really see a framework and see where it fits and where it fits not. So Lyft, I think the abstraction level in Lyft isn't that high. So you have to do quite a lot of stuff yourself. But at the end, you are also in control of everything. So it's a matter of time and money, basically. One use case. Two months does it make sense? So you have to weigh these options a bit. Excellent question. There you go. Here you go. Yeah. <laughs> May I have a question without? Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> T-shirts are. <laughs> All the T-shirts went. Yeah. Uh, I guess a couple of years ago, I wrote a blog for learning an application using Ruby on Rails. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was in, in, in interesting in Ruby on Rails is uh, a wide set of units. Mm. You can uh, so you can just have uh, a, 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 so much tests for your code. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ask, uh, I, you just uh, uh, tell something about uh, the tests. And I would like to know if uh, what is about uh, testing the, the, the application. So if you have uh, libraries or something like that, you can use. Yeah, yeah. There's actually two aspects for that. You know, if you're talking about how to test the Vardin application with that approach, two things. First is the UI architecture. That is actually the most critical thing there. The MVP, Model View Presenter, is perfect for Vardin applications. I didn't show, use it here. So basically, if you do anything with Vardin, use the MVP pattern. That also enables you to do unit test, unit test level test cases to test your UI logic. That also en enables that. And if you step one step further, there comes the CDI. So basically, MVP together with CDI, then you can orchestrate the whole thing with different testing uh, configurations. And uh, that's the way. And on the top layer, there's the Vardin test bench approach where you actually test on the visual UI level downwards. So that's how I would test the Vardin application because it's, it's only Java. The only thing that matters there is that it's the architecture supports testing. You can write a spaghetti that you can't, nobody can test, but you can do the other way as well. All right. Uh, sorry? 
Um, yeah, so basically MVC, MVC is something that you can use uh, with Vardin. MVP seems to be more popular and, and suitable. But if you are talking about, so, so Vardin is a stateful framework. So basically uh, the application or the UI class that we wrote, that is created for each user and that is stored in the uh, HTTP <coughs> session, in your web session. If you want to store the state of your session beyond the session timeout from your web application server, there is uh, extension points for Vardin where you can, uh, at least we're building, building such things where you can, um, for example, store the state on a disk or, or have it on a browser or something such. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. A bit, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So basically, it's a bit different. So, in Vardin, when someone comes into the URL, a new HTTP session is created by the web server and this is your Vardin application. That is the state, yes. basically. So as long as this session is alive, your application is there and you just fiddle around with the Java instances bound to this session and the variables stored in these <coughs> Java classes, so when you write your Java code uh, with Vardin, you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, you know, about any values, you know, to whom, to what user this value belongs, because they always belong to the same, same user. Did I answer at least? <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, so any other questions, comments? No, oh, all right. Okay, now we can run. Thank you. <laughs> all right, thanks, guys.